All right. Anybody bring a Bible? Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you what. You carry one of these things around with you, and if you know what it says, the devil will give you a little room. He don't want to be messing around with the Word of God. But I want you to turn to Psalms chapter 18, and I want you to turn to verse 30. Amen. And I want to say again how much I appreciate those that come out to the prayer meetings. It means a lot to me. And I'm going to tell you what. When you come to those prayer meetings and you're plowing into the kingdom of God, results will come. And don't let the devil make you think that your prayers have little effect in the kingdom of God. It does. And Satan fears a child of God when they begin to pray in faith when they begin to petition God according to His will. Hell will get out of the road, people. Let me tell you. You know, we, we're talking a little bit about the drug epidemic in this country. It's not a drug epidemic. It's a sin epidemic. When people turn their back upon God, it allows the enemy to come in. And what he will do is he will bring that which will destroy the body and the mind. And I'll tell you right now, pharmacia is the word for drugs. And it's a spirit behind it. And He wants to destroy our youth. And I'm going to tell you, we live in such an adulterous, sinful period of time. Our youth is corrupted like no youth has ever been corrupted before. I've seen some of the most horrible junk that tries to be passed off on the internet. I had this app loaded where funny things happened. Well, I got rid of that app because the funny things were tied in with dirty things. And this world thinks dirty things are funny, but I got news for you. Pretty soon, they're not going to have anything to laugh about because the end is about to come. And see, our job is to warn them that there's a loving God who gave His only begotten Son. And through this and this alone, they can have life. And this morning I want you to follow along as I read here in verse 30. As for God, His way is perfect. His way is perfect. The Word of the Lord is tried. And I'm going to tell you what, each and every one of us as children of God have tried the Word of God and it has been faithful. Amen. Amen. When it is embraced with faith, God will do a mighty, mighty work. He is a buckler to all those who trust in Him. In other words, He's going to take up for you. Amen. You know, just like He told Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah, when Sennacherib came against them, God told him this. Don't worry about him. I know where he lives. I know where he lives. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about your enemy when he comes against you because the Lord knows where he lives. And there's something about to be revealed. 31, it says, For who is God save the Lord? It's not Allah. And it's none of these make-believe garbage that the devil has sold to the world to think that he is God. And He's not a God that can be consumed with a cracker or a cup of wine. He's a living God that sits on the right hand side of our Heavenly Father, ever interceding for us. You know, it was kind of funny. A little bit. Let me read the rest of this. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? You know, I was sitting there watching and I flick over. You know, I don't know about you other men. My wife says, what are you going to watch? I said, I don't know, about 30, 40, 50 things in about 10 minutes. Thank it, thank it, thank it, thank it, because I get bored real easy. And I ran across that stupid uh, South Park. Man, that thing is demonic. I mean, it is demonic. For children that it's playing to, and young people thinking it's funny when they mock God. And there was a little deal on there where Kenny, he always gets killed, you know. And they had those other two little short, fat idiots that I don't know what their names are, don't care less. But they went to a Catholic church. And the nun started telling her, unless you eat 
this wafer and drank this juice right here, you're going to go to hell. So he took it home, told his friend, he says, if you don't eat a cracker and drink some juice, you're going to hell. And see, that's what religion does. It brings about lies that are personified. And it's kind of funny when you see it on that level, but the sad fact about it is the world is bought into it. I'm going to preach on a message this morning that doesn't get preached on very much. As a matter of fact, this is the second time I've preached on it in 13 years of ministry. And the title of this message is called A Conversation from Hell. A Conversation from Hell. And I'm not talking about when you get a letter from the IRS. <laughs> oh my. You know, I was audited two or three times by the IRS. And I was guilty. <laughs> but they act like it was their money. But the title of this is called A Conversation from Hell. The world does not want to hear about a God who would send someone to hell, let alone for eternity. They want to believe in a God of love who has no hell. But they refuse to believe in a God of love who gave His Son to die on a cross at the hands of religious leaders. A God that became a man who loved and lived a perfect life. And by His own free will, He loved His creator. Jesus Christ is the Creator, in case you don't know that. He loved His creation so much, He allowed man to crucify Him. He became the Lamb of God to purchase lost man by His own pure, holy blood. Heaven and hell are real. They're more real than the chair you're sitting in right now. And of course, more believe in heaven than those who believe in hell. Most moral and unsaved believe heaven awaits them at death because they deem themselves good. I have relatives. They don't want to hear anything about Jesus. I'm a good man. I'm moral. I believe in God. And they believe that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. But they know nothing of the God of this Bible, nor do they know anything about their enemy, Satan, who has sold them on a lie. Hell is not a happy topic to bring at family gatherings. Sitting around that big old turkey, got them mashed taters and gravy out there, and I'll be sitting, who's going to heaven and who's going to hell? <laughs> it's not a happy topic. We had a little bit of that topic at our Thanksgiving dinner. And they want to change the subject pretty fast. But Christ spoke of hell often. You see, man wants a salvation without Christ and His cross. That's what they want. Because if they have to accept Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son, God Himself incarnate as a man, they're going to have to listen to what He has to say. And before anybody can get born again, listen to this very, very carefully. You've got to know that you're lost. If you hide behind the face of religion or behind the face of morality thinking that you're okay, not realizing that you are lost unless you are born again, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. And you must be born again. Why? Because you are born in the likeness and the image of Adam. That's why I referred to Sister Crystal's little baby as a little sinner. Because you see, nobody gives birth to little Christians. That doesn't happen. That's why the Lord said, raise them up in the way of the Lord, and they shall not depart. For my mother raised me up as a, mm, hallelujah, mm, glory to God. It's real. 
That seed was sown into my heart. No matter where I went, I couldn't get away from it because the Holy Spirit brought it to my mind. That's why the young people today are so lost. They've never had that seed sown into their hearts. They don't even know who God is. I want you to turn to John 3.16. John 3.16. People be praying there's some lives here today that are at stake for all eternity. I feel this so strongly. For God so loved the world. Talking about our God. That He gave His only begotten Son. This is the incarnate God. Who loved man so much He would not continue to live in eternity and let his man die and go to an eternity. You see, when God created man, he created him as an eternal being. You see, God, Sister Crystal, gave you and your husband such a wonderful gift and it's called procreation. Amen. That procreation. And when that procreation takes place, this wonderful miracle of God places a soul inside that little child. And that's why God said, it's up to you. You better raise them up in the way or they will be lost in eternity. Because when that little baby is born, it's born as an eternal being. And it shall never die. Never. It will live somewhere for all eternity. You know, when you get on this side, and you see the loving hand of a God that gave such a price. When he died on that cross, we can't even comprehend right now with our little old carnal minds what was really given there. But that price was so precious that if you reject it, there's an eternal hell waiting on you. It's not that God wants you to go there. God's not a mean, statistical God. That's why He gave His only begotten Son. Satan doesn't want you to believe in a God that is faithful to fulfill His righteousness and judge you if you reject Him and you will end up in an eternal hell. I know people that are there right now and my heart breaks. Could you imagine... What is going on in hell right now? Let me tell you something. You've probably never heard of it, but there's going to be black fire. You see, that's outer darkness. You say, well, how can fire be black? Well, how can three Hebrew children walk in a fire when those that threw them in died from the heat? But the three Hebrew children walked around in there and they saw Jesus walking with them. It will be total darkness. And there will be torment for eternity. But that is not the heart of God. That is not what He wants. And I'm going to explain more why it takes place. That whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, it's a very simple thing. You see, the first thing you've got to do is know you're lost. You've got to know that you've got a need for a Savior. If you don't know that, you can't be saved. And you better pray to God. That the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of the life that you're living. This is good news, not bad news. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send Jesus in here to tell everybody they were going to hell. But that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes on Him is not condemned. Now listen. This is the words of God. But he who believes not is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now I want you to turn to the book of Mark, chapter 8. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. And I want you to go, if you will, to the 35th verse and follow along as I read. 
For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. What is he talking about here? If you choose to continue to live the life you're living and you reject the only begotten Son of God, you're going to lose the little life that you have. You're going to lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake. It's not talking about martyrism. It's not talking about you dying for Jesus. This is talking about laying down the life that you're living. And see, I'm going to tell you, this is a hard-fought battle. Hard-fought battle. Listen, I had... I wasn't a bad-looking guy when I was young. and My hair used to be jet black. And believe it or not, I actually had more of it. And I was in physically good shape, fairly intelligent. And I knew what to say that a woman wanted to hear. You want to go shopping? <laughs> For shoes? And when you got on the good side, you got those physical pleasures that you thought were pleasure and they are for a season i did the drugs i know about the cocaine what it does i know about all of those placidils those are downers in case you don't know what those are those things will knock you out i know all about marijuana i know about alcohol all of these things have a spirit behind them to make you think that you're having a good time. But the end result of each and every one of them is either go to jail, impregnate a woman out of wedlock to create enemies, have drug dealers coming after you, cheating people, stealing things so you can support your habit. I know all about those things. And see, that is so hard to let go of and realize you need a Redeemer because the devil keeps telling you, you don't want to give that up. Man, you go to church, it's boring, it's dry, they want your money. Nothing going on there. Well, the sad fact of the matter is most of the churches are exactly like that. The guy behind the pulpit ain't even saved. Preaching a dead message to dead people. But when you come into a church like this, it's a Pentecostal church where the moving and the power of the Holy Spirit has preeminence. And all of a sudden, the sinner experiences something a little bit different when they come in here. It's a little unnerving. They get a little nervous. They want to make sure they remember where that door is. That's why I love preaching at funerals. They can't get up and leave. But you see, that's a hard life to give up because you think you're giving up so much good stuff. You're giving up all these pleasures. I can't do this, man. I really enjoy it. And what about all my friends? What are they going to say? You know, I got sissified. You know, I, I, I took Jesus. I'm going to tell you what. The only real men are those that see the need of a blessed Redeemer. <laughs> Amen. And will stand up for that which is right. I don't just wear a t-shirt, man. I live the life. And I get an opportunity to preach the gospel. Brother, you're going to get it. I know my daughter, I've been more and more on this Facebook thing. And I've learned how to weave my way through it. And my daughter got on there and started talking about how bad Obama is with his horn sitting on his throne. I said, well, it's better than Hillary sitting up there with her fangs. But then I got down to the real meat of it. And you know, if you're for Hillary, God will forgive you. I mean, she wants to kill babies. She wants homosexuals to get married. As a matter of fact, they want to pass a law to make me perform a marriage ceremony between those of the same sex. Well, I got news for you. It ain't happening. Amen. Amen. But I told my daughter when I sent her a message, I said, listen. You better quit worrying about politics and you better look for the return of the Lord because the rapture is about to take place. I gave an invitation to my son to come to church. 
He's working. I gave an invitation to my other brother who ain't living right. Wouldn't return my phone call. I gave an invitation to my daughter. But she's got to stay home with her son. And I'm going to tell you what, Sister Bryant, God is hearing our prayers, young lady. And I got a Muslim grandson that God is stirring him up. Man, he's so nervous he don't know what to do. He didn't realize when he was in the hospital that this Holy Ghost filled preacher got a hold of him and started praying for him that God would touch his heart, not just his physical body. And I'm going to tell you what, that's the heart of God. And God is moving on him. He don't know what's going on. But God's going to open up the door where I can give him the gospel because his mother won't do it. His mother says, well, I've got to be a friend to him. you just got to ease into it and talk about a spirit of seeker-sensitive. Man, I used to have a bumper sticker on the back of my car that said, turn or burn. And that isn't the way God wants the gospel presented, trust me. But she needs to tell him about the gospel. You don't have to sneak up on him to tell him about Jesus. Jesus Christ is the real God and he loves you. Now listen to this. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What does it profit him? If you have all these pleasures in this world, you have all the money you want, you have all the women you want, you have all the boats and the cars, you have all the clothes, you have all the power, you have all the fame and all of this. My wife and I clicked on. We used to, when we was out in the world, we liked George Michael. Man, that guy could sing, handsome. And then I found out when he come out of the closet, about a hundred million women's hearts was broken. <laughs> Where is he today? 53 years old. He died peacefully in his home of natural causes. My wife and I were trying to figure out what's natural causes at 53 years old. Natural causes. And you look at all these other people that had everything. You look at the king of porn that had the Playboy magazine. Hugh Hefner. All the money. All the women. All the fame. Where is he today? What will a man give in exchange for his eternal soul? That's a pretty cheap price and it's no different than Ishmael. Hmm. Mm, mm, mm. Listen to this. For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. And when he comes in the glory of his Father and with his holy angels... Heavenly Father, once again, as I come before you this morning, I thank you, Lord, for who you are. And I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to do what only you can do. God, the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that he moves amongst the hearts of those that are hiding behind the face of religion. Those that are not truly born again, Father. And Lord, those that do not know you as Savior this morning. Father, I'm praying for your mercy. I'm praying, God, for your grace and your goodness to touch their hearts. Anoint this man that I can bring forth this message the way you want it, Father. And let it be brought forth with power and authority of who you are. And Satan, I take authority over you that you will not hinder this message by the blood of Jesus Christ. And once again, Father, I pray that Christ and Christ alone be exalted in this house. In the name of Jesus, I ask. Universalism believes in an afterlife without the possibility of eternal punishment. God is faithful. Not just faithful in His goodness. He's faithful in His righteousness. Well, why does God have such a, a heartburn against sin? Because the wages of sin is death. That's the outcome. There is no other outcome. Some people believe in the gap theory, and it may be true, but it's immaterial in regards to my relationship with the Lord. 
That's in Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1 and 2. They believe, and they, you, you can look through the Bible, look in Isaiah and Ezekiel, some of the other places, and kind of have an hypothesis that Satan was given rulership over earth, over a group of beings or whoever they were. And that eventually sin dominated this world. And then the earth was void and without form. That's what sin does. Sin will create a void and an emptiness and there'll be no form in you whatsoever. Some believe this is where demons come from. These are disembodied spirits that want to possess a body. That's when Jesus went to the gathering and this man was possessed by this legion of demons. They wanted to be put into a body and the Lord allowed them to be put into pigs. And the Jews were all upset because the Lord allowed these demons to go into pigs and jumped up over the cliff. Well, I got news for you. Jews weren't supposed to have pigs. They were having a little bacon farm on the side they didn't want anybody to know about. Oh, yeah. Romans 5 and 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, many, or all, were made sinners. You see, by the disobedience of Adam. God wasn't caught off guard. It tells us in the book of Peter that Christ was crucified before the foundation of this world. God knew. He already had it all laid out, knew exactly what was going on. God is never caught off guard. God is never without an answer. But He knew exactly what was going to take place. So by the obedience of one, shall many, or all that will believe, be made righteous. Second Corinthians says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, be in Christ, you can't get in Christ unless you're born again. And when you're born again, I will guarantee you, you have a brand new nature. And I'm going to tell you right now, every born again believer that doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you don't want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you better check your relationship with God because you're an incomplete Christian. You're incomplete because God... The Son, Jesus Christ, wants to baptize you into God, the Holy Spirit. You need to be seeking the baptism with the Holy Spirit because when you receive this, you'll be endued with power to be a witness. Amen. God wants spiritual gifts operating inside of His children. When you look at the book of Acts, you see some of the things that took place. Peter and John were walking up to go worship the Lord, and there laid a beggar. Said, you guys spare a little chump change. He said, silver and gold have I none. Oh, hallelujah, this is my prayer for this church. But that which I have, what he had was a knowledge of Jesus Christ. He said, I give unto you, and I walk. People, that's a confidence in an almighty God. Amen. And the Holy Spirit told him to do it. Later on, just his shadow passed over people and they were healed. My Lord, you think he went to a few prayer meetings? My. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or creation. Old things are passed away. I don't want the things that I used to hunger and thirst after in this world. I don't want an eight ball. I don't care about a joint where I can listen to hot chocolate. See, those who I'm talking about, hot chocolate, one of my favorite groups when I was smoking pot. Man, ain't nobody saying better than them when you're high. You see, that's another spirit. I don't want that anymore. What I want is to be anointed to praise and worship my God. Amen. And the only music I want to hear is that which has been orchestrated by heaven. Amen. That's why I pray for the praise and worship team. And I'm praying that God send us a Holy Ghost spirit, cross-believing, lead guitarists, and other singers that are anointed. I'm sick of the world having the talent out there that's doing nothing but leading people to a devil's hell. I want them on a platform, born again. And we need to be praying for that. Oh, hallelujah. They need to be up here worshiping God, not the devil. 
Mm. My Lord. Behold, all things are become new. When I got born again, the Lord opened up my eyes where I could see that which I was blind. You want to be able to see? Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and He will open up your eyes to see things you've never seen before. He'll open up your ears to hear His Word. He'll open up your heart that the Holy Spirit will plant the Word of God on the inside of you and it will do an effectual work on the inside of you and you'll become a radical Christian. I'm born again and I know who I am in Christ Jesus and there is no life outside of Him. Amen. But boy, in him, there ain't nothing but life and life more abundant. Woo! My Lord. I get just a little bit excited when I talk about him. Now, let me tell you something. Hell was not created for man. And see, we're Bereans. Just don't take my word for it. Take the word of God. Well, let's just check it out here. Matthew 25, 41, it says, Then shall he who is Christ say also unto them on his left hand. See, you don't want to be on the left-hand side of Jesus Christ. You want to be on the right-hand side. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Listen. Prepared for the devil and his angels. It was never meant for man. It was meant for the devil and his angels. Why? Because there is no plan of salvation for the angels nor the devil. Once they made a decision, it was forever written in eternity. It was a done deal. And it was over. You see, the most terrifying thing about hell, and I asked my wife, I always set her up. I said, honey, she, I got a question for her. She goes, Pow. I said, what's the most terrifying thing about hell? And she nailed it. The duration. It's forever and ever and ever and ever. And see, one of the sad things that happens when a person enters into hell. First, I believe there is an absolute terror. And then they realize where they're at. And then there's a culmination of things that begin that I will begin to talk about a little more. But the fact is, hell is real. Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous, you see, we're righteous by what Christ did on Calvary. But the righteous into life eternal. Hebrews 10, 31 says, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Let me tell you something. This world better wake up and know that God is God. They better get a new definition about who God is. God is the creator of this universe. He is the one that has laid out the rules. He is the one that has defined the end result of man. And he means for good. But if you reject that plan which he has made for you, you better know that it's going to be a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Oh, there's some bad times coming for those that continue to reject Jesus Christ. And here's the folly of it. My Lord, Satan has sold the lost man on such a, a, a pig and a poke, if you will. It's death. Could you imagine if Satan come up to you and said, Hey, listen, young man, young lady. Man, I got a deal for you. It's called death. And not only will you die, but you're going to die and be dead forever. And you're going to be in a lake of fire. And you're going to be tormented forever and ever and ever. You want to follow my program. That ain't the way he presents it, people. He is very subtle in the way he brings the taste of the world to you. And he does it at a very young age. Luke 16, 19. I want you to go there. This is the heart of my text. Go to Luke 16. And I want you to go to verse 19. Isn't God good? Mm. If you're there, say Amen. 
starting with verse 19. There was a certain rich man. Now let me precede this with this. Some of these lost preachers say, well, this is just a parable. This is not a real story. Oh, let me tell you one of the most dangerous things that you can do is start following a preacher that spiritualizes stuff. That's all he does, spiritualize stuff. In the Old Testament, spiritualizes it. There's a man in this town, and the church is up on North Oliver. That church does not believe in hell. It's supposedly a Pentecostal church. And we begin to, I used to talk with the pastor quite a bit. He began to listen to the message of the cross, and man, he was sold on it. He loved it, started preaching it. He'd been there for quite a few years. He's got a pension plan. He's got benefits. He's got a salary. He's got a parsonage and all that. And those that hold the purse strings, and I believe they are devil, the devil's best. Oh, yeah, because they want to be in control. They told him, you better quit preaching that nonsense because we don't accept that in this church. You know why? Because it is a relationship with Christ where your works do not bring about any righteousness whatsoever. And everything you need is based on faith and faith in what Christ did on Calvary. And that eliminates the flesh from being exalted and they didn't want nothing to do with it. And I was sitting by the, behind the pulpit because they found out that I was a preacher. And old Donnie Swagger was going to go preaching there. So they put me up on the back behind the pulpit. And I listened to this man as he began to say, there is no such thing as hell. What kind of God would create a hell? Do you think he just enjoys listening to man sit there and pop and crackle in the fire? Uh, number one, you don't even have any concept of the spiritual aspect of hell. It's not a physical existence. It's a spiritual thing. But this is not a parable. Because Jesus, what, what's he going to say? He says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Okay, well, Jesus was just lying. He made this stuff up. Just made that. No, there was a rich man that had everything he wanted. And there was a beggar by the name of Lazarus that sat out in front where this man lived. Now listen to this. Was laid at his gate full of sores. Well, if you'd have been word of faith, you'd have had money, you wouldn't have had no sores. I got news for you, buddy. You don't know the God I know. We don't serve Him because of what He gives us or how He heals us. We serve Him because of what He did on Calvary. And what I have goes far beyond this physical realm. And if that's what you got your eyes on, this physical realm, you don't know the God I serve. And you're going to have some problems going through some of the trials to get to know who He is. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Now understand something about this rich man. He kept passing by him. Well, why? Because he didn't know God as his Savior. He didn't care about the downcast in this world. Didn't care about them. And that's the way this rich world is. They don't care about those that, that are destitute and dying. The only reason, and I will say this, the Democrats want to give the poor something is so they can get their vote. Hasn't got a thing to do about their welfare. It has to do with getting votes so they can continue to get filthy rich and, and live in their lavishness so they can continue to live in this power and be exalted on the news and talk about poor dumb Trump. No different than this rich man right here. They don't care about the people. And it came to pass... Now, there may be some out there. Let me just say none, but there may be some, but I don't know any of them. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosoms. Understand something. When a child of God dies, buddy, you got an escort. You got an escort. Oh, you better know it. When I get ready to leave, if the Lord tarries and I leave by 
the way of the grave. <laughs> well, you may bury my body there, but I ain't there. I've just left with a couple of God's best. You see, whether you know it or not, you have an angel, or maybe more, too. And do you know what the Word of God says? That their face is always looking at God the Father. Why? Because He dispatches them to do things on our behalf that you're not even aware of. Amen. I'm going to tell you one of them. My wife and I was over here getting off from I-235, and we were getting ready to turn on Seneca. And an angel came down. And there was a black gentleman who was drinking coffee. And that angel must have just slowed him down. I don't know what he was doing, but he was just going, drinking his coffee. The light turned green, and he was walking in front of me, and I'm going, ah. And then a car came through the red light doing about 45 miles an hour. And I'm going to tell you, because my God, and see, they can be there like that. It's not like they got to go. <laughs> you see, they don't have wings. Seraphims have wings, but not angels. And they're there just like that. And he watches over us. Well, Lazarus was escorted by an angel's caravan of angels and took him down to Abraham. You see, back then, they couldn't go to heaven because Jesus Christ had not paid the price for the sin debt. But in the meantime, they went to paradise. And Abraham received Lazarus. Could you imagine Lazarus comes in there, man? There ain't no more sores. He ain't hungry. He ain't begging. There he is right there beside Father Abraham, who is the father of faith. That's why he was there. And was carried by, plural, the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Wasn't a whole lot said about him. He just died and he was buried. And in hell, we're talking about the rich man. This is not a parable, it's a true story. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham. The reason he called him Father Abraham is because he was a Jew. Abraham was no more his father than I am the father of my schnauzer. Now, he thinks I am sometimes. He looks at me and says, Daddy, can I bother you? I love you, man. The brown eyes when he looks at you. You let him up in your lap. You have to set your Bible over to the side, and then he curls up there. Enough of that. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Now, I want you to understand something. Mercy is gone at the point of death. It's over. It's over. He says, have mercy on me. Tell Lazarus, now listen to this, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. There's a lot of things that we see here that Jesus Christ is revealing about this place of torment. There are flames there. Now, it's not a fire that will consume. It is a fire that brings torment. Whether that's a literal fire, I have no idea. And if you're tormented, it doesn't really make a hill of beams. But he is in torment. And he is thirsty. He has needs that cannot be fulfilled. He is asking for mercy that is not available. And he never asked Abraham to help me get out of here and go over there. When he went into hell, there is a knowledge that is instantaneously acquired by the lost. One they know there's no hope to ever get out. 
And I'm going to tell you, when there is no hope, that in itself is such a torment. When there is no, why do you think people commit suicide? Because there's no hope. And those, and I'm not saying that everybody commits suicide go to hell because there are Christians, that there are people who have mental problems or whatever. That's up to God. But there's no hope. So they want to end their life. In hell there's no hope, but they can't end the torment. It is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Get this through your mind. Well, preacher, why are you telling me? I'm born again so you can have a burden for your lost loved ones. Amen. And there are people in here that need to hear this that don't know the Lord. And I know that. And Abraham said, Son, remember? Isn't it amazing that Abraham was given this knowledge? Remember that you in your lifetime received your good things? You see, all these things that the devil wants to sell you on. You know, you had your drugs, you had your food, you had your clothes, you had your cars, you had your fame, you had all the money that you had, you had all of this, you even had good health, and blah, 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 and you had all your friends and stuff like that. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted, and you are not tormented. That doesn't mean all poor people go to heaven, and all rich people go to hell. But he did say it was going to be pretty tough for people to have the things of this world to make it into heaven going to be very tough because their reliance is upon the things that they have. And he says, and you are tormented. And beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. This is fixed by God. So that they which pass from hence to you cannot there's no way for them to get over to you and you can't get over to them because God has put a barrier there that cannot be crossed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can you pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, and this is the rich man, I pray thee therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Talking about Lazarus. Now right here is where I discount all these people that said, Well, you know, I died and I went to hell and I saw the torment and I felt the pain and the flames and, and all that. And God brought me back and, and I wrote this book that you can get for 1995. And then I'm going to go to churches and they'll pay me for speaking there to tell you about hell. And then, you know, people are going to give their lives to God. No. Let me tell you something. Right here, the Word of God speaks against that. I don't buy into it. That's not to say that they didn't have a dream about it or something like that. I'm not saying that. But he says, then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. So we know that the rich man knew that his brothers were headed on the same track. They were headed to the same place. They all came from apparently a wealthy background. And he said, I want you to send them to warn them not to come here. Let them know I'm down here in hell and there's torment here. Don't come down here. Don't be with me. Lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham says unto them, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have Pastor Jim. You hear what I'm saying? God called us not to just bless the body, but to warn the wicked of what is waiting on them if they reject Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Amen. Now listen. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Oh. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. 
Because you see, if God could save people by sending people to hell and bringing them back, we'd have them all over the place. And they'd be preaching the gospel of don't go to hell. But see, that isn't the gospel. The gospel is a good news. That Jesus Christ came and gave His only begotten Son, who is Jesus Christ. He came to this earth to give man life. And it takes faith to believe that. But don't get me wrong. Here in Jude 23, it says, And others save with fear. We tell them about a place you don't want to go to. And that's what I'm doing this morning. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In other words, self-righteousness. That which you think you are good enough to make heaven. I got news for you. You will not make heaven based on your goodness. And let me tell you another thing too. Just because you say, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. The Word of God tells us the devil does too. And he also trembles at the very name of Jesus Christ. So don't think just because you have an intellectual ascension, well, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, that ain't going to get you nothing. you got to be born again. you got to know that you need a Redeemer. You need a Savior. If you, the only thing in life of value is being right with God. I'll tell you a few things about hell. Hell is down. Hell is a pit. Hell is a prison. Hell is a place of eternal sorrow. Hell is a place that is never full. See, there's always plenty of room for new people that want to go there. Oh, they won't say, I want to go there, but the life they're living in the rejection of Jesus Christ is their ticket. Hell is a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Hell is a place of damnation. Hell is a place where the fire is never quenched. Hell is a place, now listen to this very closely, their worm dies not. Hell is a place of eternal regret. People, I have a sister-in-law that is there right now that my heart breaks for. I have an ex-business partner that is there right now. I can't imagine the horror that's going through their mind. And let me tell you something. People that go to hell, they ain't having a party down there. It is outer darkness, and you are isolated. There's nobody there that you can hear their screams or hear their stories. You are totally isolated. Do yourself a favor. At night, turn all the lights out. And go sit in your closet for a minute. And close your eyes where you can't see nothing. And that doesn't even come close. Doesn't even come close to what hell will be. Second Peter 2 4. Listen to this as I read it. For if God spared not the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eight, a preacher of righteousness, listen, brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those who after should live ungodly. Listen. He is a God that will not compromise His righteousness. He will not compromise it. I want you to go to Mark chapter 9. And I'm almost done. I'm going to let you go. You're going to get out of here just on time here in a minute. Go to, go to Mark chapter 9. And I want you to go to verse 43. See, the Word of God is the only thing that really matters. Now listen to this. I'm going to go ahead because I'm running behind. Verse 43. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Jesus Christ is trying to get you to understand how serious this is. It is better for you to enter into life maimed 
than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire. Now I want you to listen to this very close. That never shall be quenched. Where the worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. This is twice. What does it mean? Now listen to this very closely. Where their worm dies not. What do you mean their worm dies not? You see, when you throw trash away, there's this maggots that get in there and start eating it. Start eating at it. Eat at it. Eat at it. When I worked on the trash route, one of the worst things I hated was for a maggot to get on me and I didn't know it. It wasn't that he was nasty. The little creatures bite. Man, I did. I, I, I was sitting there. I looked. I said, boy, you little maggot. And he really was. He bite. You see, this worm is what's going to play through your mind for eternity. It's this worm that continues to gnaw, continues to eat away on you. You better know I'm telling you the truth. If you miss heaven and go to hell, you're going to remember every word that I've preached this morning. And it is going to go through your mind. And it is going to go through your mind over and over. You're going to relive every sin that you committed. Every time you had the opportunity to accept Christ and you rejected Him. It's going to go, this is not a fairy tale. This is what Jesus Christ told us. And He is faithful to His Word. And if your foot offends you, cut it off. It is better for you to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. He tells us for the third time. Where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. He keeps telling this over and over. My Lord, what, what, do, you, what do you got? What has to be said? Now here's the sad thing. Well, I don't really believe that. Well, then you're calling God a liar. And you will face that for all eternity. God says it is true. And that worm will forever, 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 forever. Now what does he mean cut your foot off, carry your cutting? He is going to such a drastic point. It would be better off for you to cut off your hand. That won't stop you from sinning. Or cut off your leg. What he's talking about, there has to be a drastic change in your life. If there is not you're going to end up in a devil's hell. If you want to continue playing with the things of this world, when you continue to entertain the things that the devil keeps putting before you, and you keep holding Jesus Christ to bay and say, no, not today, maybe some other time, but right now, i got some things to do I want to do. He said, you might as well cut your hand off, cut your feet off, so you won't keep going down that path, because that is a path of destruction and death and eternity that is irrevocable. It will never be changed for eternity. Now listen. And if your eye offends you, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Now here's something for the Christians. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Listen to this. He's talking about the Word of God. Every born-again believer had better study the Word of God, and you better know what it says, and you better believe the things that God lays before you. The salt is good. That's the Word. But if the salt have lost his saltiness, wherewith will it season it? Have salt in yourself and have peace with one another. And I want to read one more scripture. And I want the praise and worship team, please, to come back up here. I want you to go to chapter 20 in the book of Revelation. And I want you to go to the 11th verse. Now I'm going to go ahead. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. 
And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. You see, God's got a lot of books. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. You are to understand that hell is nothing more than a waiting place. It's bad enough down there, but that's not as bad as it's going to get. My sister-in-law that is there right now, ex-business partner, other people my brother knows, and I'm sure each and every one of you may know somebody that went by the way of the grave that you don't believe they knew the Lord as their Savior, that are there now waiting, and they know that judgment is coming. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, You see, this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I want you to stand to your feet this morning. And I want every head bowed. I want every born again believer praying. There are souls being weighed in the balance this morning. This is probably one of the most serious times in some people's lives that are here this morning they've ever experienced before. And I want you to think about your spiritual condition as they sang this song for just a minute. Pray, saints. Mm. I want you to think for just a moment the condition of your soul. I want you to be honest. And I want every head bowed right now. Are you born again? Do you know that you know that you know you are born again? And if you're not, do you realize that you're lost without Jesus Christ? You are a sinner. And God will not allow sin into heaven because it's a destructive force that is in opposition to God. You better ask yourself this eternal question. Am I a sinner? If I'm lost, Lord, will you save me this morning? Lord, I'm asking. I want to be born again. I want to come into your kingdom today. I don't want to be lost forever. Don't hide behind the face of religion. You may have been coming here for years, but you know you're not born again. You're just religious. You go through the motions. You don't really know Him. If you know that you're lost this morning and you want a Savior, I just... I won't embarrass you. I just want you to lift up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me, Pastor. I'm lost. Thank you for those hands. He's a loving God and He's tugging on your heart this morning. Hallelujah. He's a real God and He is a judge. He is a Savior. He will accept you now into His kingdom. 
and you will have eternal life. But if you turn Him away, you could lose your eternity and be cast into a lake of fire is the Word of God so plainly says. But that's not God's plan for you. He wants you to accept life, not death. Now I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. Let me just stop for a minute. There's somebody else here I know that needs God that didn't raise up their hands. Don't fight God. Don't fight the Holy Spirit. He wants to give you life. If you walk out of here today without Him, you have no guarantee of tomorrow. You could end up in a crushed chunk of metal. And when you go to hell, it's forever. It will never change. I'm telling you right now, this preacher is telling you the truth. There is life in Christ. He will open your eyes and He will heal your heart. And He will show you what life is really all about. Is there one other that would say, Preacher, pray for me. I know I'm not saved. I know I'm not. My Lord, don't turn him away. Don't turn him away. He loves you. I know the devil's trying to convince you. Don't come up. You'll have to give up all the good things you like. They're not good things, they're death that you're embracing. It's death. It's not life. Those pleasures will be taken away from you. Mm. All right, I'm not going to wait any longer. Here's what I'd ask. Those that raised up their hand, don't even hesitate. Come up front here right now. The Lord has made a way. Come up here right now. Don't, don't even think about it. Just come on out. Let them by, sister. Okay? Hallelujah. He called on my son, that's life. The Lord knows your heart. <laughs> the Lord knows your heart. <laughs> yes. Oh, amen, amen. He's a good God. <laughs> Oh, yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I want every one of you to come up here to receive the Lord as your Savior. I want you to look at me. I want you to look at me. Look at me. I know some of you have gotten cold. But the Lord says, I want you back. The Lord knows your heart. He knows your heart. Brother, <laughs> you've already accepted Him in your heart. He knows. He reads the heart. <laughs> this is received by faith. You know that you're lost without Him. That's the first thing. The next thing is, you believe that He's the Son of God. That He died for you. And He wants to give you life. He wants to give you life. He wants to give you life that you can't get on your own. Sweetheart, He wants to give you eternal life if you will believe this morning. It's not a religious maneuver. It's not just coming up here saying, okay, I don't want to go to hell. This is believing in a risen, real person named Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you right now, heaven is rejoicing. Your name is being written down in the Lamb's book of life right now. He knows you. He knows your life. He knows where you've been. And He's called you back this morning because He loves you. Brother Terry, He loves you. <laughs> Got tired of eating what the pigs were eating and it's time to come back to the Father's house. And I want you to look at me because I want to pray a prayer with you. These words will not save you. Amen. You're saved because of what you believe. And I want everybody in here to pray. <laughs> that your voice will not be alone. Amen. And you can close your eyes if you like. And just repeat these words with me. Listen everybody, repeat these words with me. 
I want everybody to stop praying for a moment and listen to me. This is one of the most important events in eternity in your life. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. I know I'm lost. I know I'm a sinner. And I'm asking you this morning, forgive me of the way I've lived, the sins that I have committed, and I repent of them, and I turn from that life, and I turn to you, the giver of life. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on Calvary. I believe your blood was shed for me. I believe my sins are washed away. And I believe that you were resurrected from the dead. And this morning, I receive you as my Redeemer, as my Savior, as my Lord, and as my God. Oh, amen. 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 I want to tell you something. Amen. Listen to me very closely. You need, you, oh, how, <laughs> you, man, I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something that's extremely important. What's your name, darling? Michelle. Michelle, let me tell you something. You need to learn about this God. You need to know this God. You need to come to church. You need to continue to be in the presence. What is your name? Todd. Todd. I love you, man. <laughs> you became a real man today, buddy. A real man. Praise God. I'm rejoicing along with heaven, people. You need to be here in church. Satan will try to get you out. He'll try to stop you from coming here. Because if you come here, you're going to learn the Word of God. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues with the power that God wants you to have. It's real, Michelle. It's real. It's real. It's real. you got a man worth holding on to now. Sweetheart, God wants to use you. You have something in you now that's a precious gift that He wants you to tell other people about. And I'm going to tell you the first thing you need to do. You need to go tell somebody you know. You tell them, I gave my life to Jesus Christ today. I am saved. And I am born again. And I've given my life to Him. Be a witness. The Lord said if you're ashamed of Him, He'll be ashamed of you. If you deny Him, He will deny you. But I'll guarantee you one thing you're going to experience is the power of God. When you begin to witness to somebody that's lost, you need to tell Brother Tim, it's time to come home. It's time to come home. Amen. I want you to give the Lord another great hand clap of praise. Amen. Heaven is rejoicing. I love you guys. And we got, come here. We got some things that we want you to fill out today and give back to this man. Fill them out today and give this back to this man. I want you to stay up here until you get that. And as we close today, I want you to sing whatever you want to sing. I want to rejoice.